This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Okay, so welcome back. Today, I want to talk about one of the biggest barriers to developing trust and facilitating change with our clients. In the realm of coaching, it's actually our desire to help clients achieve their goals that could sometimes lead us to fall into the trap of what is referred to as the writing reflex. Now, this reflex is most often well-intended. But nonetheless, it can harm the coaching relationship because it undermines trust. It creates what's called discord, where the coach does something or says something in a certain way that creates a level of resistance in the client because they feel invalidated, they feel judged, they feel that the coach has you know their own agenda. And the bottom line is whatever creates discord, if it's not resolved, and, and the best way to resolve it is to try to avoid it in the first place, it can erect barriers to meaningful change. So what I want to do in this episode is explore what the writing reflex actually is, why is it so problematic, and how does it manifest in coaching sessions? So we'll also dive into the psychological dynamics that make the writing reflex particularly detrimental, including things like cognitive dissonance, reactance, how it impairs accountability, capacity, and also can be problematic when it comes to conflicting commitments and needs, which is ambivalence, which is one of the biggest reasons in my mind why people seek out coaches in the first place is to help them resolve ambivalence. It's not to give people the answers. It's like, I don't know what to do and I need you to tell me what to do. As a matter of fact, if if that is stated too early in the coaching relationship, when they're not really far along in the trans theoretical model of change, that cycle of change, an outright request, tell me what to do, is actually sustained talk in, dis- in disguise, where they're kind of like on the fence. So they know they need to change, but there's also a built-in reason to that storyline as why they can't change or why change isn't going to come about regardless or what the immovable barriers are. And a lot of times asking for somebody to give you something because you lack the capacity is an indicator of sustained talk. Now, later on in the cycle of change, that's probably not true. And I'm not saying that's true in every cycle, but a lot of times that is what they are doing. So what people are really coming to us for sometimes is because they want two things that are in conflict with one another. You know, I want freedom and and like to live my own life on my own terms. I also want to start a brand new business. Well, those two things in the beginning anyway, for the first couple of years, they're in direct conflict with one another. Anyway, g- getting right back to the writing reflex, it, it's kind of an automatic tendency. I don't think a lot of us are aware of it, but it, it's our tendency to correct or fix what we perceive as being wrong in other people's thinking or behavior. You know anybody like that in today's society? <laughs> <laughs> any, any any of those people like have your same surname and live in your household. I rest my case. But it's well-meaning, yet it is an impulse to offer solutions, give advice, or steer someone toward the quote-unquote right path without fully understanding their perspective or their underlining motivations and fears. In coaching, this reflex can manifest as a coach quickly jumping into or offering guidance, correcting the client's course of action. And they believe that they're helping this person avoid mistakes or to achieve their goals more efficiently. I know that when I first got, became a personal trainer, way, 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 way back, I don't want to like give away exactly how old I am, but it was a long, long time ago, I would jump into this. I would ask a client or a potential client about their goals. And the second they would have a goal without really engaging and understanding their level of commitment to the goal at the moment, I would just jump right into salute. Well, here's how we're going to solve it. And it wasn't because I thought I knew better, but I thought that I knew enough that somebody was seeking my quote unquote expertise 
So it, it was a hierarchical relationship. I have expertise that you need. That's a problem. Number two, I didn't acknowledge that the person I was talking to might not have my level of expertise when it comes to physiology or anatomy and biomechanics, but they were the undisputed expert of their own lives. And, but I thought that was my job. I had to tell people what to do. And while the intention behind that is usually positive, like it is for so many people, it can have some really negative consequences especially in a coaching relationship. So when coaches act on this reflex, you might find yourself inadvertently taking control of the session, or if you're not a coach, you know, um, <clears throat> this is kind of where you might've been on the receiving end of this. And on what it does is it leaves the client feeling disempowered and misunderstood. And that could really damage the coaching relationship, erode trust, and ultimately create discord, right? Which is coach generated resistance, easy for me to say resistance rather than fostering change. And, and there's a psychological impact in the writing reflex. And if we're going to understand why the writing reflex is so harmful, we kind of have to examine the psychological mechanisms that trigger it in clients. So there, there's multiple key concepts that can help explain the impact of the writing reflex on the coaching relationship. I think a good place to start is number one, cognitive dissonance. And when I say cognitive dissonance, I mean the thing that occurs when a person experiences discomfort due to holding conflicting beliefs when their behavior contradicts their beliefs. Like, well, I believe that health is one of my most important values, but you know, I eat a lot of junk food and I smoke cigarettes. That creates a certain level of cognitive dissonance. When a coach imposes their perspective or solution on a client, it can create that cognitive dissonance or at least magnify it. And the client might feel pressured to adapt a course of action that might not align with their values and beliefs. And that leads to internal conflict. So this dissonance can result in the client either outwardly agreeing with the coach but inwardly resisting the change or rejecting the coach's advice altogether. Or even worse, they'll just go along and comply because, okay, I guess, you know, this coach is the expert and I just got to do what they say, but they're not really intrinsically committed. So the first time they encounter friction or it gets really tough, which it will 99.9% .9 of the time, what do they do? They lack the resolve, not because they're lazy and not committed. It's because the commitment was never theirs in the first place. It was compliance that was driving the behavior. And since we're on the subject of commitment, let's talk a little bit about reactance. Reactance is a psychological response where individuals resist attempts to limit what they believe to be their freedom to choose or their autonomy, if you will. Right. So if somebody's commit, if somebody is having a commitment imposed upon them, that restricts the sense of autonomy and autonomy is a critical element of intrinsic motivation without autonomy, autonomy, there's no real intrinsic motivation without intrinsic motivation. There's likely not sustainable change in behavior. So when a coach acts on that writing reflex, the client might perceive it as an infringement on autonomy, which triggers what's called reactance. And instead of feeling supported, the client might become defensive, which means they might end up resisting the coach's suggestions, even if, or, or sometimes especially if they're logical, beneficial, and they're rooted in valid evidence, because now the person really feels invalidated here. And this, this resistance is not the client being kind of difficult to deal with, or, you know, the coach has to double down and try harder to motivate this person. You know, it, it's something that needs to be recognized as soon as the coach is feeling that temptation to jump in and solve without really understanding what are the drivers of commitment in the first place. Because if they can't resolve that or if they can't resist that temptation, it can create discord in the coaching relationship. And that attitude of the coach, not the client, could become the most significant barrier to change.
And, and you know, let's talk about accountability. So this morning I was on a coaching call and, you know, somebody had said, oh, you know, you know what I love about, you know, the comment that this coach just made, I won't use any names. I love the fact that you're holding this person accountable and oh, it was beautiful. The coach said, no, what, what am I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm holding them accountable to their own commitments and I'm, helping them recognize wins to facilitate efficacy. So very gently, the coach kind of reframed the fact that my job is not to hold people accountable to me. Like they're accountable to themselves. And I'm actually recognizing where their wins are and pointing them out to develop a sense of efficacy. And when I mean efficacy, efficacy occurs when there's a combination of two attitudes of mind. One is a belief that change in the area that I'm seeking change is possible. I believe it's possible to change this. Two, I believe that I have the skills and abilities to engage in certain behaviors to bring about that change. So when you have the merger of those two perspectives, belief and capacity, efficacy emerges from that. And that's critical. So getting back to accountability one of the fundamental principles of coaching is that the client is responsible for their own decisions and actions, not the coach. I mean, otherwise, it's our wins and our losses. So the writing reflex undermines the sense of accountability when it shifts the responsibility from the client to the coach. And so many coaches are well-meaning. They're like, oh, I'm going to hold you responsible. You know, I'm going to make sure that you make the changes that you said you want and not realizing that in the research, that is one of the most damaging things any of us could do to the forward momentum of our client's journey of change, if you will. So when a, when a coach consistently provides solutions or directions, the client could also become dependent on the coach's guidance, reducing their own sense of ownership over their process. So the dependency doesn't only hinder the client's development of self-efficacy, but it also weakens their commitment to the process of change itself. So we talked about accountab uh, accountability, and I also mentioned capacity in there. Well, let me expand on capacity. Change requires not only the willingness, but also the ability to act. When coaches engage in the writing reflex, they might overlook the client's current capacity for change. And again, capacity or ability refers to the client's emotional, psychological, and practical ability to implement change at any given time. So by pushing solutions or actions before the client might be actually ready for them, the coach can overwhelm the client. And this could lead to frustration, burnout, or withdrawal from the coaching process completely. So it's critical for, for coaches, for us that are, that are coaches, to recognize and respect the client's pace and readiness for change. Now, I said something earlier in this episode that's not true. I said, if you're not actually a coach, if you are in a relationship and you have a sense of partnership with that person. This could be a best friend. This could be the person that you're romantically involved with. If you're a manager, if you sell anything, if, if anybody utilizes any of your services, your experiences, your products to add value to their world in any way, shape, or form, you are involved in conversations that can benefit from a coaching-based approach. We are all coaches. As a matter of fact, Gallup in their book, it's the manager by Clifton and Harder said that in many organizations that they have studied and they have studied organizations extensively, one of the main barriers to growth and profitability within an organization is management. It's poor management. And one of their preeminent strategies is making that jump, crossing the chasm from seeing yourself as a boss to a coach. So we're all coaches. Anyway, getting back into, um, the, the psychological dynamics, I, I think the next one is conflicting commitments and needs. Clients often face conflicting commitments and needs that, that complicate their ability to change. 
So here's an example of what I mean. You have a client that might express a desire to advance in their career while at the same time, they're afraid of the increased stress and the time demands that come with a promotion, right? That ambivalence. The writing reflex can lead us as a coach to focus solely on the expressed desire. We hear career advancement without fully exploring underlying conflicts. And this is a one-dimensional approach that can cause the client to feel misunderstood and further entrench them in their ambivalence, which makes it a lot harder for them to move forward, right? So if you imagine ambivalence, these two conflicting needs, these two things that are really important, right? So that time demand that they might be afraid of could take away from their family. So yes, their job, their career is important, they're motivated, they're committed to it, but they're also committed to and place a great level of importance on their family. So if ambivalence is quicksand, the more we start to initiate a writing reflex, the deeper we sink that client into that quicksand, making forward movement nearly impossible. So to illustrate how a writing reflex can manifest in, in a coaching situation, here, here's a couple of examples, right? So in our first example, let's say that we have a client that is expressing frustration with their lack of progress in a fitness routine. So the coach, really eager to help, caring person, immediately suggests that they should follow a new workout plan and diet regimen. But now the client starts to become disengaged and feeling that the coach hasn't really considered the emotional logistical challenges that they have that have been preventing them from sticking to their routine in the first place. And instead of addressing the root cause, the coach's writing reflex has now led to a superficial solution that the client kind of resents and therefore very unlikely to sustain. But in another example, Let's say we have a client that mentions that they're considering leaving their job because they're dissatisfied with the work environment, but they're also understandably worried about financial stability and how that affects the family. Now, the coach acting on a writing reflex tell, tells the client, look, I think you should stay in your current job while you're going out and looking for other opportunities. That's reasonable, isn't it? Right. I mean, that is a reasonable solution to or, or a possible one possible solution to a problem. But the client, on the other hand, feels that the coach hasn't really acknowledged the depth of their dissatisfaction or the importance of their well-being. It's, it makes sense. It's logical from the coach's perspective, but it's completely invalidating to the client. So the coach's advice, although it's practical, creates a sense of discord because it fails to address the client's conflicting needs. Another example could be client says that they're struggling with procrastination and the, the coach suggests straight off the bat several productivity techniques such as time blocking or, hey, how's about we use a to-do list app? You know, I'm kind of actually looking for a new one right now myself and the client nods along <clears throat> and the coach is like, yeah, they're really with me. But internally, the client's feeling overwhelmed by the idea of adding even more tools to their already stressful routine. The coach's writing reflex leads to solution-focused approach that overlooks the client's underlying anxiety and need for emotional support. And we have a society that reinforces this. Be solution-focused. Yeah, but maybe I'll understand the person's ambivalence, the root causes, their fears, and using reflections and inquiry, we can evoke a possible strategy to move forward from the client rather than trying to impose one upon them. So to avoid the pitfalls of the writing reflex, coaches can adapt a client-centered approach that emphasizes active listening, empathy, and the exploration of the client's internal world. Here's some strategies to prevent the writing reflex from undermining the coaching relationship. So number one, ask, don't tell. My friend Ian O'Dwyer, who is a brilliant um, practitioner out of Noosa, Australia, is very fond of 
reminding students all over the world about this at conferences and his mentorships. And what he's talking about is instead of immediately offering solutions, engage in inquiry, mostly open-ended inquiry that encourages the clients to explore their thoughts, their feelings, and their motivations. So instead of suggesting a new workout plan, you, know, you might want to ask, you know, what do you think has been the biggest challenge in sticking to your current routine? You know, um, another question could be, well, what plans have you been most interested in? And you know, what was it about that plan that engaged you in the first place? And what do you already know about that plan that interests you? So these are a couple of examples of open-ended inquiry rather than just jumping in with a solution. Second would be reflect, don't direct. Reflect back the client's words and emotions to demonstrate understanding and help them gain clarity. So for instance, in response to the client considering leaving their job, the coach might say something like, well, it sounds like you're feeling really torn between your need for stability and your desire for fulfillment. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Three could be exploring capacity as well as readiness. Before you jump into solutions, explore the client's capacity and readiness for change. This can be done by utilizing questions such as, what do you feel ready to take on right now? Or what resources or support do you think you're going to need in order to successfully make this change? Four is honor autonomy, right? We talked about autonomy. Autonomy is critical. Reinforce the client's autonomy by making it clear that they're in control of the decision-making process, not you. Instead of directing them to use a productivity app, the coach might say, well, there are several strategies that might help with procrastination. Would you like to explore some of them together? Or, or is there something else that feels more aligned with where you are right now? So basically the writing reflex though it's often driven by a genuine desire to help, it can be a significant barrier to trust and change in the coaching relationship. But if we recognize and resist this reflex, we can create a more supportive and empowering environment that honors the client's autonomy, addresses their underlying needs, and respects their capacity for change. If we do this, we can take advantage of an opportunity to foster deeper levels of trust, reduce re resistance, and facilitate more meaningful and therefore sustainable transformation for our clients. So let's talk a little bit about outside of the writing reflex, how do we resolve ambivalence? Because we talked about one of the biggest things that clients come to us for is to guide them through resolving their own levels of ambivalence. So understanding ambivalence in coaching is, is probably, you know, it's probably one of the most significant and challenging obstacles when we don't appreciate the magnitude of influence this has over our clients. So if we're dealing with someone who has mixed or contradictory feelings about a particular goal, a behavior, or a change, and they don't really get to the root of what's driving that, again, like our quicksand analogy, it can get them stuck. So in coaching, understanding and addressing ambivalence is critical because it lies at the heart of why individuals struggle to make and sustain changes. Even when they express a strong desire to do so, which is confusing for some beginning coaches, now, what we're going to do is, I, I think, let's explore the nature of it, its roots and conflicting values, and how coaches can, can help clients to resolve ambivalence and, and, and support the emergence of meaningful and lasting patterns of change. So we had said already that Ambivalence is what happens when an individual simultaneously holds both positive and negative feelings towards a certain behavior or decision. So client expresses a desire to start an exercise program because you know, they really want to improve their health, but they also feel resistant due to the commitment and dysfunction associated with working out. So they've got this internal conflict that can lead to things like procrastination, indecision, and ultimately inaction. Um, ambivalence 
one thing I want to be really clear about here. It's sometimes it, it's misconstrued as a sign of weakness or a lack of commitment. It's anything but. In actuality, it reflects the complexity of human motivation and the compelling priorities that individuals face. So in their book, Immunity to Change, a former CEO that I used to report into, he had asked me to read this book, and I am so glad he did. Immunity to Change was written by Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy. And in the book, they explore how deeply ingrained beliefs and complete competing commitments can create an actual immunity to the change process. And this is even when a person is consciously committed to making that change. You know, they're not messing around. The commitment's real. And this immunity is fueled by, you guessed it, ambivalence. And the individual's conscious desires are kind of at odds with their unconscious fears and conflicting values. So let's say <clears throat> this person grew up in a household where their parents fought all the time and there was so much conflict and this was a bit traumatic for this individual. And, you know, sometimes our highest values come from our deepest voids and being creating supportive relationships are really important to this person. But you know what else is important? Avoiding conflict. And that's a problem because a lot of times when we both, like when two or more parties want different things or they're looking to collaborate and co-create together and they have different perspectives on how to go about it, conflict is not only something that's nece that, that's unavoidable, but it's something that's necessary. It could be highly valuable when that conflict is the result of not who's right, but rather what's right. But this individual at work, they simultaneously desire to have engaging and meaningful relationships that are built on support and cooperation, yet they simultaneously are terrified and they value avoiding conflict at all costs. That's an example of where people really get stuck. So one of the most common and challenging sources of ambivalence is that conflict of values. It's not just that I want two things that are in contradiction to one another. They're rooted in values. And, and because, because of that, we have these deeply held principles that are guiding our behaviors and, and our decisions. And sometimes we're not even aware of where that conflict is coming from. Because when a person's behavior is misaligned with their values, it creates internal tension and ambivalence. So a person might value career success and spending time with their family like we talked about earlier. These aren't just two things I want. I want to be home, but I also want to succeed. I might deeply value and to a degree I'm defined. I identify with these two things. So when these two values come into conflict, such as like when a really demanding job starts to encroach on my family time, it can result in ambivalence about pursuing career advancement. So in coaching, it's essential to recognize and address these conflict of values. If a coach overlooks or dismisses this ambivalence, the client might feel misunderstood or, or even pressured, which again can lead to resistance and a breakdown of the coaching relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, the research is clear, like upwards of 50% of the successful outcomes that are facilitated through coaching and therapy are based on the quality of the relationship between the therapist and the patient, the coach and the client. So it's critical. On the other hand, when behaviors and values start to align, the path to change becomes clearer and more intrinsically motivated. So no one has to be reminded, motivated, persuade, or threatened to pursue what's most important to them intrinsically. Uh, like over the weekend, I didn't get to go because um, we're old and, you know, the movie was too late at night. But a friend of ours wanted to go to a movie with us and she was going to take, you know, her kid and her kid is dying to see the movie. Had a really long day, had multiple sports practices, but even though he was tired, how much motivation or how much of a pep talk do you think it took for him to go to the movie with mom? And the answer is not very much. And by not very much, I mean none, because it was aligned with what he enjoys and it was aligned with his values. So let's talk about why it's important, again, to resolve ambivalence. And it's critical because it creates 
when you resolve ambivalence, you create clarity and commitment that's necessary for sustainable change. When ambivalence goes unresolved, it acts as a powerful barrier. It prevents an individual from fully engaging in the change process. And this is where concepts from immunity to change become really relevant. Keegan and Leahy suggest that resolving ambivalence requires surfacing and addressing the underlying beliefs and assumptions that fuel it. This involves helping clients identify their their competing commitments and the quote-unquote big assumptions that sustain them. For example, if you have a client who's ambivalent about pursuing a promotion and they, they might have a competing commitment to avoid increased stress. And based on the assumption that you know, more responsibility is ultimately going to lead to stress, they get stuck. But if we can help them explore and challenge this assumption, because it is just a story, it is a big overarching assumption, we might be able to help this particular client reconcile that conflicting value, reduce ambivalence, and move towards something that one year from today is really going to make a difference in the quality of their life and the level of fulfillment and pride they feel. So here's here's some strategies for addressing ambivalence in coaching that do not require any form of writing reflex. One, explore values. Begin by helping the client identify and clarify their core values. Again, asking open-ended, non-directive questions like, you know, what's most important to you, you know, in your career right now? Or what's most important to you in your life right now? Um, or what's most important to you related to health and fitness right now? Another question could be, how does this goal align with your values? Understanding the client's values can provide a foundation for addressing ambivalence and aligning behaviors with what truly matters. The things that they don't have to motivate themselves to pursue. They don't need to be quote unquote enthusiastic. So second thing that we could do is identify conflicting commitments. And we could do this by utilizing the concept of competing commitments from immunity to change to explore what might be holding a client back. One question could be, is there something you're worried you might lose or have to sacrifice if you pursue this change? You know, this can help uncover hidden commitments that are fueling ambivalence. Number three, challenge the big assumptions. Once competing commitments are identified, we could work with our clients to challenge the underlying assumptions that they have. Again, an example of a question could be, well, what evidence do you have to support the fact that that assumption is true? Or how can you test this assumption in a small, safe way? This process can help the client see that some of their fears or concerns might not, it's not saying it's not valid. It's very valid and it's real, but we're helping them see it might not be as insurmountable as they believe them to be. So number four, align behaviors with values. And this is where we help the client identify small actionable steps that align with their core values and reduce ambivalence. So an example, if a client values both career success and family time, you know, we can explore ways to achieve a balance such as setting boundaries around work hours or maybe delegating tasks to reduce stress. When behaviors align with values, ambivalence decreases. And simultaneously, that means that intrinsic motivation increases. And number five, Create a safe space for exploration. You know, we're so into, did I succeed or did I fail in my goal? Well, there's, it's not that black and white. There's space in between. So encourage open and non-judgmental dialogue about the individual's level of ambivalence. You know, it's okay to reassure them that ambivalence is normal. Like it's normal to have mixed feelings about change and that exploring these feelings is a crucial part of the coaching process. This type of openness and vulnerability by itself can help to build trust and create a supportive environment that allows the client to resolve their own ambivalence. And, you know, when ambivalence is effectively addressed, clients often experience a renewed sense of clarity and commitment. They become more confident in their ability to make decisions that align with their values, and they become more motivated to pursue their values without the need for external reminders or pressures. Like, 
Intrinsic motivation is a powerful driver of sustainable behavior change because it taps into what's most important to this particular individual on a deep personal level. So by helping clients resolve ambivalence, you know, as coaches, we can facilitate a more effective and meaningful change process. You know, clients are likely to achieve their goals and maintain progress over time because those goals are driven by a clear sense of purpose and an alignment with their highest values. So again, ambivalence is natural and often it's unavoidable within the change process. You know, a lot of times we get this confused, think, well, if someone is experiencing ambivalence, they may not want it badly enough. No, they want it badly enough, but they also might want something else really badly as well. And they legitimately, sincerely hold both desires for both things. It's normal, especially when one thing has to fade away for another thing to emerge in someone's life. There might be a feeling of loss that they're experiencing. But just because ambivalence is normal doesn't mean it has to be a barrier. If we understand the roots of ambivalence, particularly conflicts around values and employing strategies to address it, you know, as coaches, we can move people from indecision to action. You know, drawing on the, the insights from Immunity to Change by Keegan and Leahy, you can, you can gain not only the importance of resolving ambivalence to support behavior change, but they beautifully lay out a process within that book. Um, it's not a quick read. I found it to be a really enjoyable one. But what I would suggest is that you consider picking up a copy of Immunity to Change because it is a really good book. Look, it's this simple. When behaviors and values align, the path to change becomes clear and clients become empowered to pursue what's most important to them intrinsically without the need for external motivation or pressure. Let's talk about a tool. All right. I hope you go out and you get the book, by the way. I have no financial business connection or, or other type of connection to Keegan and Leahy. I just really like their book. But if you don't buy their book and you want a tool, like how do I resolve ambivalence if I don't have this book now? Well, there, there is one. It's called the Decisional Balance Sheet, and this is a very popular tool utilized a lot in uh, methods like motivational interviewing to resolve ambivalence, right? So it's a simple tool, but it's powerful, and it helps individuals to weigh the pros and cons of their choices and, and bring clarity and insight into the decision-making process. So... It's often presented as a table or a grid where the individual can list the advantages and disadvantages of taking a particular course of action versus not taking it. So when you're completing a decisional balance sheet, it encourages reflection on the potential outcomes of different choices. And by doing so, it helps to clarify how those choices relate to the client's values, priorities, and motivations, or the employee's values, priorities, and motivations. So when you take a look at the quadrant, typically in the first quadrant, let's say um, our advantages of changing. So the pros of action could be another way of putting this. And this quadrant lists all of the potential benefits, or as many as, as, as the coach can guide the client to come up with, for making the change or taking the proposed action. Then you have another quadrant that identifies, well, what's the disadvantages of changing? Here, the individual lists potential downsides or challenges associated with making the change. In the third quadrant, well, what are the advantages of doing nothing? <laughs> what if we didn't change? How would that benefit us? And this quadrant captures the benefits of maintaining the status quo or, or you know, like, like we said, like doing nothing. And then finally, you have the disadvantages of not changing or the cons of inaction. And here's where you're guiding the client through listing all of the drawbacks and negative consequences if they don't make this change. So when you fill out each quadrant, the individual starts to get a more comprehensive view of the decision, and it makes it easier for them to see where their ambivalence might be coming from and how to resolve it. 
So here's how we could effectively utilize a tool like the decisional balance sheet within a coaching session. You know, a coaching session with a client, it could be with an employee. I mean, it could be a friend at a coffee shop who's just going through stuff and we're trying to help support them and sort it out. So you introduce the tool. You could start by explaining the purpose of the decisional balance sheet to your client and emphasize that you know, this is a non-judgmental exercise that's designed to help them explore their thoughts and feelings around a potential change. And there are no right or wrong answers because people will start self-editing before they even get started. The goal is simply to explore and gain clarity. So two is identifying the decision. This is where we clearly define the decision or behavior that the client's considering. So an example would be, should I start a new exercise routine or should I leave my current job for a new opportunity? Or should I like throw financial sensibility to, no, that's a bad, anyway, forget that. So it's important to understand that the client's really specific about the decision they're evaluating. The greater the clarity they frame that question or the greater they define that specific decision that they're looking to, to e provoke or evoke is a better word, the better. The third step is just fill out the quadrants. Work with the person to fill out each quadrant of a decisional balance sheet, encouraging them to be as detailed and honest as possible. And here's how you might guide them through each section. So let's say the advantage is changing. Ask, what are the potential benefits of making this change? And, you know, hey, how might your life improve after these changes have been made? Disadvantages of changing. You might ask something like, well, what are the challenges or downsides of making this change? Or, you know, what are some of your concerns that you might have about it? The advantages of not changing. You, well, what are the benefits of staying where you are? What do you gain by not changing? Disadvantages of not changing. This is where you can ask, what might you lose or or miss out on if you don't make this change? And what are some of the risks of inaction? And then finally, number four, reflect on the results. Once all the quadrants are filled out, take time to reflect on the results with the client. And this could be done by asking questions like, what stands out to you about this balance sheet right now? Or how does this help you see your decision in a new light? Or, you know, the goal... Here, here's something that really works. You know, focus their attention on the benefits of making the change. According to the research, that is the most powerful predictor of change within that decisional balance sheet. So the next step could be explore conf conflicting values because those will come up later. So while the benefits of change and the number of benefits that they can come up with is really powerful, it doesn't mean we don't explore conflicting values. And an example of this could be if you have a client who's torn between career advancement and family time, this tool can help bring those values into focus by asking the question, how do these factors align with what's most important to you? Or, or what value conflicts do you seem to be noticing here? And finally, number six, facilitate a decision. The ultimate goal of a decisional balance sheet is to help clients make decisions with greater confidence and clarity. So by encouraging them to weigh the pros and the cons and consider what matters most to them, you're empowering them to resolve the, con the, the internal conflict that stops them from taking action. One question could be, well, okay, well, given what we've explored, what feels like the best path forward to you? And this process can really help the client move from contemplation to a greater level of commitment. You know, I think in one episode, we talked about the darn cat, right? So it can move them from wanting to make a change, feeling that they have the ability to make a change, knowing that there are reasons to make a change and they need to make a change to the mindset of, okay, I will make a change. The first 
letter C in cat, or, you know, I think I'm ready right now. Activation, the A in cat. So again, when we're talking about tools like decisional balance sheets, the benefits are one clarity. You're helping the client to see the full picture of the decision. This makes it easier to understand ambivalence and what's driving it. And sometimes when you put something on paper that they were scared of, they see it on paper and it's not nearly as intimidating or as limiting as they assumed it might be. Second benefit is self-awareness. By reflecting the pros and the cons, clients gain greater insight into their values, priorities, and fears. Empowerment is another big benefit because this tool encourages clients to take ownership of their decision, which fosters a sense of autonomy. Remember, that's critical and that's empowering. And finally, you know, resolution. It, it creates a structured way to resolve ambivalence. And by resolving ambivalence, we increase the chances that we are helping our clients to move toward the decision that aligns with their values and goals. So the decisional balance sheet is a really practical tool for helping clients to resolve their own level of ambivalence rather than getting advice or the coach weighing in based on a writing reflex. I hope you got some tools out of this that you find either one interesting to explore further, like picking up the book Immunity to Change. Okay, that's the last time I'll remember. I'll mention that book. Um, or you know, there's something that you feel you can use with somebody in your life tomorrow to really help them take the steps to bring about change that's critical in their life, or for yourself. Maybe you're listening to this and going, you know what? I think I want to utilize this decisional balance sheet in my own life as a tool because we are our own coach, aren't we? Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.